What is up my triggers, Eccentric Hat here. Welcome to the first of an ongoing series called MR Radio. With me today are Philip Tanzer and Elizabeth Hobson, both of whom I hope you already know, but if you don't, they have excellent content, very similar to mine, on the problems that men face in the modern era. We are going to discuss the state of the nation today, and we're going to discuss it in the chronological order of a man's life. So please sit back and relax as we delve into misandry and all of its fallibles. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction, Head. Thank you very much. So I think the most logical place to start is the first incidence of disadvantage that uh, thankfully a minority of boys baby boys face in the UK and that is genital mutilation. So objectively it does appear to be illegal under the Offences Against the Person Act 1861 and yet somewhere around 8% of boys are believed to be subjected to the procedure. Well I, I, I completely agree Liz. I mean uh, the first thing that I would say straight off the top of my head is that for any movement that repeats constantly the value of bodily autonomy, it is, it is completely ridiculous that they would not be on top of this issue and would have been on top of this issue decades ago. Talking about the feminist movement, I assume. Yes, indeed. Indeed. I, I, I agree a certain extent but i i would say even though the feminist movement claims that they are for equality they are focused on women so i i don't blame them completely for not focusing on circumcision um, what i have a real issue is that um like health practitioners and that um like the un that they say Female genital mutilation is one of the most abhorrent things there are, but if you cut a boy, it's absolutely fine and we don't even have to talk about it. And that even organizations that um, whose job it is to fight for boys, or for, for, to fight for children's well-being, they say that circumcision is not a big that it's not child abuse. I'm like, how can it not be child abuse if you cut a kid's skin off? It's, it's I kinda, very difficult for me to understand the logic behind that. I mean, I, w I would simply say um, that, although you're correct, Philip, that, that feminists fight for women, they still use that dictionary definition of the equality between the sexes. I mean, you know, I am perfectly happy for them to fight for women if they give that dictionary definition up because it is a saving grace to them. So they have to choose one or the other. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree with that. But I think it's our job as men's rights activists to fight for um, for men and boys, which we are, which we are doing. It's, well, I was just going to say, you know, the thing is, um, although, you know, I spend my time generally fighting on behalf of men and boys, when women's and girls' issues do crop up, you know, I will have something to say about them. And, you know, the difference is, um, if I see somebody talking about FGM, I will say, yeah, that's absolutely awful and abhorrent, and, you know, it needs to stop. But if you present male genital mutilation to a lot of feminists they will say well they're not really comparable you know um, FGM is much more injurious which simply isn't true um, the most common form of FGM is the ritual nick where they essentially prick the clitoris with a pin and it has no lasting physiological damage whatsoever which is not to say that it's um, acceptable because yeah. it's not you know children's genitals belong to them and if they want to consent to a procedure like that at 18 that's fine but adults shouldn't be consenting on their behalf um, whereas you know the most common form of male genital mutilation is, is the removal of an entire bodily organ that's yeah. very important um, and you know 
most of actually it's it's only the US who um the medical establishment there does promote male genital mutilation if you look at the NHS the NHS's position is that the risks of the procedure outweigh the benefits and for that reason most NHS trusts don't fund the procedure um however you know some do because it's safer for the procedure to be carried out in a safe sterile environment rather than the unregulated clinics that offer it elsewhere and actually that's one of my big issues with male genital mutilation in the UK is the fact that pretty much anyone can set up a circumcision shop and just cut babies with no training you know not the the practice aren't inspected to make sure they're up to standard um so yeah I, didn't, I wasn't even aware of that I, I didn't know that Liz yeah that's but I, I I think it's, in my opinion, it should be the duty of the politicians um, and the government to oppose uh, child abuse. And to me, it's very clearly child abuse. And I'm shocked that when it was when it was brought up that there wasn't um, wholehearted support of um, tackling that issue. And at least talking about it, they don't even want to talk about it. And that to me is absolutely shocking. Well, one thing I have noticed whenever I do bring this up with feminists, uh, as you say, Liz, is that a large uh, number of them will dismiss it and simply say, well, you know, anybody that I know who has had circumcision doesn't seem to mind it. You know, and to bring it back to that sort of parallel about bodily autonomy and abortion, I would say that the majority of women who get pregnant um, unexpectedly go on to have the baby. So why would banning abortion be a problem? You know, like you have to have a consistent logic. And I also think that in countries where female genital mutilation is normalized, um, women will say they don't have a problem with it. I'm pretty sure of that. And case it would be it would be blamed on patriarchy and it would be said that these women are brainwashed into liking it which to be honest i think is true um but so are we especially in countries like america where it's so common um people are brainwashed into accepting uh, abusive behavior to babies just because it's the norm well that, I, I, the and and um you know, Britain, where uh, FGM, you know, sadly is still practiced illegally in, in some cases, quite often it's the mother who's insisting on it. Exactly. Yes. I mean, the thing is, though, you know, you say that it's the politician's job to oppose child abuse. And I certainly agree with that in rhetoric. But, you know, if you look at FGM, as far as I know, only one person has been convicted. It was a mother. Um, but, you know, the fact is that courts are very loath to convict parents who are otherwise good parents. And, you know, these people generally are, you know, um, obviously in the UK, it's largely practiced by Jews and Muslims rather than the rest of the population, you know, and they are not bad parents. They are just, you know, the parents are culturally brainwashed into thinking this is acceptable behavior. Um, and so I think, you know, while the knee jerk response is like, this is clearly, and it is clearly child abuse. I'm not convinced that make it or clarifying because it is illegal, but you know, to, make it so that it's actually punished yeah. would not cause more suffering than it would save. So um, I think the thing we can do is work on education. And here the government can come in because, you know, all parents, when they're having their first child, especially attend neonatal yeah. classes. And, you know, in areas where there's a prevalence of circumcision, why not just throw in a lesson on the of the foreskin yeah you know I, I i completely agree with you um that banning something if the 
cultural change hasn't happened it's not the right way forward and i think in regards to uh uh, male genital mutilation, I think you have to talk to the religious communities and say, um, because it's a very important step for the religious life uh, of these groups. And I think it's important to sit down and say, there should be a ritual, but it shouldn't have the action of the circumcision. So maybe you can have... Um, a ritual that represents the circumcision, but then the child can decide at a later point in his life when they turn 18 to either do it or not do it. And I think that's, that's respectful to the culture and respectful to children. Can I yeah. ask, um, Les and Philip, do you believe part of the, the reason that politicians are so reluctant to tackle this issue is because it's a religious um, hot potato. I mean, I know that the, um, the, the MP for Rotherham, Sarah Champion, uh, was uh, demoted from being a Labour shadow cabinet member because she, she did speak out against the, the travesty that happened in Rotherham a few years ago. Um, you know, it, it was it, to do with uh, Islamic, uh, a, a, a small group of Islamic people. And she con uh, condemned that, which it absolutely should be condemned, but Labour took her out of the shadow cabinet. And it's, you know, it's so easy for politicians to, uh, to, to lose uh, a, a huge part of the, the public's acceptance if they are seen to be even slightly anti-Semitic or Islamophobic. Well, to be fair, I don't think it's public acceptance. I think it's um, establishment acceptance. Because I, I did, you know, if around and talk to people on the street about what happened there, I tend to doubt many of them will say, yeah, you know, she should have been taken down a peg. Um, I mean, you know, she's an interesting case because she was, you know, she came out in Parliament as having abused her husband. And, you know, she got called stunning and brave for that. But yet when she, you know, raised a real issue, that was that was too far it's bizarre it, you know it's a very blatant kind of you know the domestic violence any any male he would have been shown the door had he admitted to assaulting his wife of course and no, I, I, treated um, exactly same. I, I don't think she should be you know have a political career after that um, it's difficult to say, for example, if a female genital mutilation was a religious practice rather than a cultural practice. I, I wonder if that would still get banned and or and criminalized. And I do think it would simply because um, the feminist movement, with all its flaws, I mean, they are very strong. And I think they would put a lot of pressure um, on the government to get it banned. Um, because it's not a religious practice, but a cultural practice, um, there's not as much protection for female genital mutilation as there is for circumcision. But you, like from a cultural point of view, it's difficult to compare the two. It drives me mad, though, you know, because people talk in this... Um kind of you know situation about religious freedom and i'm all for religious freedom but what about the religious freedom of the infants who are cut you know and marked as part of this tribe because there's no saying that they're going to grow up and be happy that that's happened you know and um the data from the global survey on circumcision harm showed that many men are not happy that that happened to them you know many men grow up to leave the religion that their parents brought them up in um yeah, hmm. yeah but I, I think as a religious practitioner um you you and I, I don't think that's good but you want your children to follow in your footsteps and i think imprinting them on your religion um is obviously very stuff selfish understandable I, I can understand it i but i don't think it's a good thing 
Well, you know, religious freedom, just like with almost any other freedom, should end where someone else's rights begin. And someone's right to genital integrity should triumph over someone else's religious freedom. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That, I think that was a great last sentence for the first topic. I agree. Shall we move <laughs> to education? Yes, please. 